having the validation of an organization like TED say, this is an idea worth spreading and we want to help was really all I needed to say, okay, you got to go for it. Bonjour, bonjour, and welcome to Mission First, the podcast to get inspired and to learn from successful entrepreneurs who are building a sustainable future for our planet and its people. I am Gilles Toussaint, your host and the founder of GT Impact, a growth and digital marketing agency working only with companies making a positive difference in this world. Growing a company that aims at having a sustainable impact is not easy. That's why I created Mission First. In each episode, I interview one entrepreneur who has a sustainable mission and who has recently gone through the difficult first years successfully. Together, we discuss their challenges and what they have learned on the way. We go into detail with a specific focus on company culture, leadership, financing, growth, and business strategy. That way, you learn hands-on tips on how to build a better future and a successful company too. Today, our guest is Jeff Kirchner, a fantastic storyteller and an inspiring entrepreneur. With his startup Literati, he created a community of 170,000 people who are on a mission to clean the planet. During this episode, you will learn how he started and financed Literati as a solopreneur in parallel to his consulting career, how his TED residency, his TED talk and their Kickstarter campaign contributed to his progress, how he started growing this community organically using only Instagram without having to build an app, how the power of its why helped him attract his first collaborators and his co-founder, how they managed to move the community from Instagram to the Android and iOS app, which was a very tricky move. And Jeff was extremely honest by sharing with us his biggest mistake with literati, how that mistake hurt him and his community and how they fixed it with his team. Finally, Jeff also discussed with us his list of four do's and don'ts on how to build a community, which, as promised, are super insightful and hands-on tips for you. Without further ado, sit back, relax, and enjoy this episode. Hi, welcome to this podcast, Jeff. I'm really happy and excited to have the chance to interview you because I'm so inspired by your project and how you managed to create a community of more than 150,000 people who are cleaning up the environment around us, collecting litter in, I think, more than 165 countries around the world. So I think that's really inspiring. So thank you very much for being here with us today. How is it going? I've heard that you had some really big news today. Um, you want to share them with us? I'd be happy to. And thank you so much for having me. I, I really appreciate it. Um, we were fortunate enough several months ago to be included um, as part of a sustainability accelerator that was put on by Plug and Play and the Alliance to End Plastic Waste. Uh, and they examined a thousand companies and Literati was selected as one of the 10 uh, for this accelerator. Today was demo day and we were just told that we were awarded the top startup of the batch. So uh, we're honored and the team is, is feeling really good. It's a, it's a good day for us to celebrate uh, a little bit of a win. So that's great. That's amazing. So congratulations for that. Maybe you can start first by explaining our audience a little bit in a few words what Literati does. Yeah, Literati is a global litter intelligence platform. We are a platform that is powered by people. And the way it works is very simple. It starts with a photograph. So we have an iOS and Android application that anybody can download. And you take a photo. And our uh, machine learning will extract what is the object, what is the material or the brand from that image. And we understand the geotag of where it was taken and, and the time of when it was taken. And what we are doing is effectively building this community that is crowdsourced cleaning the planet one piece of litter at a time and using all of that data to help create a litter-free world. Great. So how big is the community now? I, I said 150,000 people, but I know the numbers are like increasing like very, very fast right now. Do you have the, the exact number? Yeah, so we've crossed over about 170,000 now and it's in 165 countries, um, averaging about 10,000 pieces a day, which look, when you think of the massive problem that we're up against, that's not a lot. 
but we are growing rapidly and every day we're making more and more of a dent in what we would consider one of the biggest global pandemics we face. Yes, I saw a great video from you and your daughter explaining, for example, it took six years to pick up the first one million like pieces of litter. Uh, it took one year to pick up the second million and now six months for the third million. Do you have an idea how long it's going to take for the fourth million? Yeah, actually, we're now over five million pieces. We have uh, just this past month crossed over 5.4 million pieces. And, uh, you know, I think the reality is when you get lots of people working towards the same common goal, it's amazing how much impact can be created and how quickly. That's really something I, I want to talk about in a, in a few minutes is to talk about how you build that community. Um, with the business model that you have, and also for, for, for the impact, of course, it can have, um, you have a lot of brands and companies and cities working with you now. How, how many of, of these partners are working with you? Well, it's interesting. We have, I guess you would consider four different groups of partners. Uh, the first are schools. We're in hundreds of schools. Um, the second would be NGOs. So we, we work with a number of NGOs all around the world. Um, these are mostly environmental groups who are out there doing community cleanups and keeping beaches clean and the ocean. Um, a number of brands who are either doing employment engagement programs or they're interested in learning about their own uh, environmental footprint. And then quite a few cities. And so, you know, for us, it's about really building a platform that can solve this problem that everybody faces together, which is how do we engage people to contribute to a clean planet? And so whether that's a fifth grade class or the entire city of San Francisco, how do we build a tool that is simple yet sophisticated so that everybody can be part of the solution? Okay. And how many employees do you have? We are about 17 total people involved in the company. That's a mixture of both full-time and, you know, some contractors, uh, but 17. 17. And uh, so it's a LLC in the United States. Does it stand for like a profit or a non-profit company? So you are correct. We are structured as an LLC, which is a for-profit entity. We are on the road to becoming a B Corp, which stands for benefit. You know, our belief is that um, we really can value both people, planet, and profit. And the way to create the most impact is to create uh, a sustainable organization. And, and so really that's the path that we're on. So for our audience, um, I've learned about B Corp recently as well. What does it mean to like, what does it mean to, to become a B Corp company? Well, you're really adhering to a certain set of standards. Right. And so there's what's called B corporations and there's B certified um, without getting into the details. What it really means is that sort of in the charter of your organization, your mission is front and center. And in, in the case of a B Corp, it means that your mission, that public benefit um, uh, really cannot be compromised. So that is always what is your North Star. Um, and sometimes the financial decisions you make may not necessarily be in alignment with the larger benefit. So let me give you an oversimplified uh, example of that. Let's say I was going to purchase T-shirts for everybody in the company, and I could buy inexpensive T-shirts that were made 5,000 miles away, and they cost 99 cents. Or I could buy T-shirts that were uh, locally sourced from organically certified cotton from a supplier who met all the necessary criteria, and they cost you know fair trade suppliers, and, and those T-shirts cost five dollars each. It's going to be more expensive for us to buy the five dollar T-shirt, but it's more in alignment with what we believe in as a as an entity. That's a great. That's great to hear because this podcast is called like Mission First. Um, so yes. I think that's a per in perfect alignment to to this podcast. Um, regarding the, the the financing part, I would like to talk about it a bit later. But just to to have an idea as well, do you have any financing round? Have you have you had any financing round before, or are you totally bootstrapped 
and are you profitable or have you like broke even yet? Sure. So we ran a Kickstarter campaign several years ago, which was successful. Um, and that brought $50,000 into the company. And more importantly, it really started help enabling us to build our community. Um, we then went to raise a seed round of capital uh, for $1.5 million, uh, which we uh, are sort of in the middle of now. We closed $500,000 from accredited angel investors um, and then received a million dollar non-dilutive grant from the National Science Foundation. Um, we have generated revenue uh, in the last two years um, and we uh, are in the middle of closing that seed round now. Okay, this 1.5 million. Correct. Okay, good. So that, I think that gives us a very good idea of where, where you are now and what you do. Um, what I'd like to start, there, there are two things I would like to really talk about today is the, the funding and financing part and the different steps because you were also in a very specific um, conditions to start this business, uh, meaning that you, you are an entrepreneur, you've done... Uh, two other startups before, and you were a cons you had your consulting company before that at the same time as, as starting Literacy. So, but one of the main achievement of of what you've done is definitely to be able to grow this huge community, and I'd like to talk about that. So, can you tell us a bit how Literacy started and put put yourself back in in these days in tw 2012, I think, and. Uh, What is the first thing you've you've done, and how how what was the inspiration for Literacy? Um, you're correct. It did start in 2012. Uh, I was walking in the woods with my two kids, who at the time were only four and two years old, and my daughter noticed a plastic tub of cat litter sitting in a creek, and she looked at me and just said, "Daddy, that doesn't go there," and it was an eye-opening moment. I was living in San Francisco and in, in the Bay Area. And we as a community are known for being environmentally responsible and ecologically progressive. And yet everywhere I looked, there was litter. And when she said that, it reminded me of when I was a kid, I used to go to summer camp and the camp director would often say, quick, everybody go pick up five pieces of litter. And so you'd get 200 kids, they're all picking up five pieces. And within a few minutes, we had a spotless camp. And I thought, well, why not apply that crowdsourced behavior to the entire planet? And that was the inspiration for starting Literati. So you, you took a picture of that litter with your daughter and what did you do with it? Yeah, so actually what happened after she made that comment was a little bit strange. So I took a photograph uh, of a cigarette butt using Instagram. And I'd love to tell you that there was this idea for, you know, building a community. I'd, I'd love to suggest that I had this, this belief, but I, I, it wasn't even a thought. I just took a photo. And then I took another photo of another piece of litter and another photo of another piece of litter, all using Instagram. And I noticed two things happening to me. The first was that litter suddenly became artistic and therefore approachable. So the bottle cap that was lying on the ground that typically I would have walked over suddenly became a really interesting photo opportunity. The second thing that I noticed was that after a week, I had 50 or 60 photos on my phone, and I had picked up every single piece I had photographed and properly either thrown away or recycled or composted. And I realized that the same way people are measuring the steps they walk or the miles they ride or the calories they consume, I was measuring the positive impact I was having on the planet. And so I started telling people what I was doing. And that was really the beginning of Literati was simply as a hashtag on top of Instagram. Um, that was, as, as there's a term in Silicon Valley or in the tech startup world called the MVP, the minimum viable product. And, and really that was our minimum viable product, uh, simply a hashtag on, on the Instagram platform. So how, how do you promote it at that time? How, how, does it, how does that grow and what was the next step? Well, what was interesting was that I started telling people that Literati was using Instagram to clean the planet. And what was fascinating was that that would always invite a follow-up, like, well, what do you mean? What do you mean Instagram is cleaning the planet? And it allowed me to tell people 
what I was doing. You got to understand at this point, there was only, you know, a couple of people in this community. You know, it was like me, my brother, my wife, <laughs> a few friends, like that was it. Um, but what we were all doing, we're taking these photographs of specific pieces of trash on the ground, adding the hashtag literati, and that was it. And so we would literally search on a hashtag in Instagram and we would see other people who were picking up photos and tagging them with literati. But it enabled me to start telling a story. And I think that is such a critical component to any you know, new startup or any new organization or movement. You, you got to figure out like, what's the story you're going to tell? in a way that is, as my old boss, John Matezik would say, clear, concise, and compelling. What is it about what we're doing that other people are going to say, wow, that's interesting. Tell me more. And so at that stage, I was literally saying, we are using Instagram to clean the planet. And that typically got people thinking, or excuse me, that typically got people asking, what do you mean? How does that work? Tell me more. And at that time you were, so literally at that time, what do you do? You hadn't you hadn't the, the company yet? Do you create a website? Do you just create the Instagram like account of Literati and you start sharing everything there? Yeah, you know what's funny is that we had none of that. There was no company, there was no website, there was no Instagram account. It was literally my Instagram account. And so what what happened was that you can imagine my Instagram account was suddenly filled with pictures of trash. And so I think the next step was, okay, I, I, I don't want to have like all these pictures of bottle caps and cigarettes next to pictures of my two new, you know, my two kids. I should probably start a new Instagram account. So that was the beginning of starting the literati Instagram account. And so that was like the quickest next step I could make to start to build a brand. So the brand really, if you, before there was a company, before there was anything, the brand, if you will, was a hashtag. Then it was an Instagram account. Uh, and that got us to sort of the next level. And what was the next level? How do you promote? How, how do you grow from there? Yeah. So it was tricky. But the idea was you don't need to download an app. Like our, our messaging was don't worry about downloading an app. Use something you already use every day, which is Instagram. All you have to do is take a photograph of a piece of litter add the hashtag literati and throw out or recycle what you're finding. That it was that was the message. It was how is this super, super simple for an action that you're already doing? And that was great because everybody at that point knew what Instagram was. Instagram at this point, you know, had not been acquired by Facebook, but it was a global phenomenon with about 300 million people on, on their platform. So everybody knew it. Most people had it, at least most people that I was coming in contact with had it. Um, and so that really allowed us to start to build a story and build, you know, a bit of a community. Granted, this was a community on top of Instagram, but it was our own little community. And it was really a community centered around this hashtag with this one literati Instagram account, which was just me going around taking pictures of trash where I would find it. Yeah. And Instagram at the time was also very, very organic. So I guess people would just follow you. Or like the, the hashtags where you're driving a, a lot of people. What, what kind of hashtag were you using at the time? I was, so you're absolutely right. It was very organic at that point. Um, I was really using just the literati hashtag because I had, remember, I had started using my personal Instagram account and I was using the literati hashtag. And that's how I was finding other people who were also using that hashtag. And so what I mean by that is, you know, I started telling people what I was doing. I would speak at a school or I would get invited to speak at like the Monterey Bay, Bay Aquarium in California, which is a well-known institution. And I would tell my story. And so all of a sudden others using their own Instagram accounts would use the literati hashtag. And this was the way I would find them. But what happened next was I learned that every photograph actually held a ton of data. So I started adding hashtags like Starbucks plastic cup or Coca-Cola aluminum can. So now my each photo would have the hashtag for the object, the hashtag for the material, the hashtag for the brand, and then of course, hashtag literati. So it was becoming this interesting way of collecting information about what was in the photo. I then learned that each photo also had a geotag and a timestamp. And so if you think about it, 
suddenly every single photo could tell us who took a picture of what, where, and when. And that was a really, that was sort of a light bulb moment for me because I realized that this was no longer just a collection of pretty pictures taken by people. This was really a community that was generating data. And that was, that was a pretty cool um, moment. So you, you developed the whole community at the beginning with your Instagram, your Instagram account, and then you do it with creating the, the account of Literati. And you start to like have word of mouth around it by just speaking at schools, at different like places, and it starts to grow to grow organically. And then you realize all these things about the geolocalization and how you could use the data to grow it even more. Uh, at that time, you were you you were still a, a consultant. You had your old consulting like activities as a freelancer, I guess. When was the point where where you decide to say, okay, there is something here. Uh, I, I probably I want to grow it more. So, uh, what are the next steps to to grow the community and grow the company? Also, in terms of financing, how do you do that? Yeah. So, one of the things that was really interesting about getting the word out was, you can imagine I would be taking a photograph of you know something on the ground, and people would see me doing that, and they would say, "Excuse me, what are you doing?" And so that invited the conversation. And almost every time, people would be intrigued by that. Wow, you're taking photographs of uh, you know, a cup or a can or a bottle, and you're telling me that there's data involved, and that data can be used for interesting things. And that was a way of just engaging people. And, and I, you know, some people would join the community, and I'm sure some people would forget about that and, and never think about literati again. But slowly but surely, one person at a time, the community started to grow. Um, you know, I didn't have a Twitter account. I didn't have a Facebook page. There was none of that yet. Um, and yes, you're right. I was still freelancing um, in the world of advertising because that's where I started my career. I was then giving a talk in Hawaii. And um, I got a call from my wife who said, do you know about the TED residency? So I would assume many of your listeners are familiar with TED. Um, and I didn't know that they were offering a residency, but it was all about finding 20 people around the world who they were going to bring uh, internally into this residency program uh, for ideas worth spreading. And so I applied and was very lucky to be accepted. And I, you know, I remember saying to my wife, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave you and the kids for four months and I'm going to move to Manhattan and uh, how in God's name could we possibly do this? And, and she just said, how in God's name could you possibly not? And so when I was accepted and I moved to New York for that period of time, that's when I realized that there was something here because having the validation of an organization like Ted say, this is an idea worth spreading and we want to help was really all I needed to say, okay, you got to go for it. And so that's when that was in the fall of 2016. So during like between during four years, you grew it organically, just word of mouth and with your like with your Instagram account. And then you go to TEDx, Fed, to the TED residency during four months. Uh, at that time, w were you already like, so do you get some financing to do that and to, to stop you because you stopped your work during four months? Was it the first finance like financing, like let's say help you get? No, I did not have any financing at that point. So I was taking money that I had made freelancing and, you know, putting that towards, you know, the business, but it wasn't really going towards the business because there was no business at that point. So if you think about it, one of the, I think, lucky decisions that was made early on was using Instagram. Like I didn't have to worry about application development. I didn't have to worry about server costs. I didn't have to worry about storage at that point. So there weren't a lot of company related bills. Sure, there were some travel related costs and things like that. But any money that I made from freelancing that wasn't going towards, you know, food for my family, what I was using to, to you know, promote literati by me going to places to talk to people about it. Um, But while I was at TED, there was a very critical decision that was made, which was, 
I knew that at some point, if we wanted to design an experience that was more in alignment with where we wanted to go or where I wanted to go as, a, as, as literati, I would have to build an application. We would have to, at some point, migrate away from Instagram and into our own app. And so that was, that was really tricky because, you know, back to the storytelling, for the last four years, I had just spent, you know, every waking hour promoting this idea of photograph a piece of litter using Instagram, add this hashtag, throw out the litter. Suddenly, I had to now shift and tell an existing community, hey, I know that you've been using Instagram. Now we're going to use an app. And by the way, I you know, really wasn't sure how I was going to do this. I'm not an engineer. Um, but that was the pivot that we needed to make. And so I decided that that's what we would do. And I had a friend who had a friend who was about to enroll in an iOS development course. Uh, and he needed a project to work on. And I needed an app. And so uh, a gentleman by the name of Gilbert Bogosian started developing the first literati application for iOS. And suddenly we were no longer just a hashtag on Instagram. Wow. And so all of that happens after or during the, the, the TED residency? Yeah, sort of yes and yes, like during and a little bit after. And, uh, you know, it's not a binary um, moment. It, it happened a little bit before and then certainly during and then continued after. And what was what has been the hardest part? So there, there were a, a number of challenges, um, not the least of which is I don't code. So I was not in a position to really assess the quality of code, the quality of, you know, the application other than I knew what I liked about it and what I didn't and if it felt good. And then I certainly got feedback from people. Um, but one of the challenges was not knowing what I didn't know. In terms of the challenge of migrating people from Instagram to the app, once again, back to storytelling. So the the story now was look this is a superior experience and the reason we believe it's superior is that it's much faster you no longer have to add the hashtag literati because now it's all within the literati environment and it's optimized for taking photos quickly whereas instagram is optimized for making your photos beautiful and enabling your community to see them my story now was This is optimized to help you collect as much data as fast as possible. And what was really tricky was when we were on Instagram, you know, if I took a photo of a Starbucks cup and it was beautifully framed on a beach, I would get a lot of likes. And that makes you feel good, right? When people like your photo, it, it, it releases dopamine. It's a good feeling. There were no likes in the first Literati app. In fact, there are still no likes in the Literati app. And so suddenly that feel, that good feeling that people were getting from posting photos on Instagram was gone because we didn't offer that in the MVP of the iOS app. So that was, that was tricky, but you know, we managed to kind of overcome that hurdle. And frankly, we've never looked back. And how, how did you, because that, that's a bit of like the chicken and egg problem, like it's successful Instagram. People are, as you said, very happy to just share the pictures, see a lot of likes, uh, see, I don't know, more followers or anything. And then they come to your app and they, I guess it, what you're telling me is that like the people have already like noticed that or give you, given you feedback about that. So I guess you, you might lose some, some people you, you wanted to attract to your app, um, How, how, what have you done now to overcome that? Well, for sure. Like some people are still on Instagram using the literati hashtag and that's great, right? Like our, look, our bigger mission is to inspire people to, to contribute to cleaning the planet. And if you want to do that on Instagram, or if you want to do that without using literati, fantastic. Like the job is still getting done. We believe that the key to solving the problem involves community and data and without some form of technology, that's going to be next to impossible. Um, but look, if we can inspire people to, to clean the planet, then, then that's great. Um, there were a number of other challenges that I, I think are worth bringing up. So all of a sudden we are telling people that iOS is where we are and that's where you should find us. Suddenly we have people on Android who are saying, can you build an Android app? And that is a chicken and egg as well because you're excited that people are wanting 
and asking for what you've built. But I didn't have an Android resource. I didn't know anybody that could build an Android application. Like I was only, I only had one other person who was taking in sort of in the middle of their development course who, who could help us out. So suddenly you're in this fascinating scenario where you're like, okay, I have this app. I know other people are asking for it on Android. Now I got to go find an Android developer, but I don't have any money for that individual or for that team. H- how do I figure that out? So I think one of the lessons learned, which I know is sort of a, a, a big um, theme for, for your, your podcast is um, you have to just do the best you can with what you have, no matter where you are. And it is never going, you are never going to have all the resources you want, right? There's always something you're lacking, something you wish you had, whether it's a software, a specific person, um, a market opportunity, a customer, you're never, you never have everything. The puzzle never fits together perfectly. And I think therein lies the trick of like, how do you stay resilient and creative and and scrappy to figure out, okay, I, I need this thing. What do I do to, to get and obtain that thing? Um, because I think it's what's going to get us to the next level. And this situation with Android was a perfect example of that. And how did you solve it? So I was at an event and, um, you know, I was sharing our story and people were asking, well, how can I help? And I kept saying, I need to find an Android developer. And similar to the iOS story, I met someone who said, I have a friend who has a friend who I think would believe in your mission. And I I do think that one of the advantages Literati has always had and and many social ventures and social entrepreneurs have this is you have this bigger mission, right? You're trying to solve a problem uh, that a lot of people can relate to. And I think that when you're trying to solve a problem that a lot of people can relate to, people want to help. Right? They, they want you to solve this problem. And if they can contribute to it, um, they want to. And this was no exception. So this person said, I have a friend who runs a, a small development firm. And why don't I introduce you? And so I met a team. Uh, the team is called Diginito Labs. And I met their founder named Eb Tang. And Eb said, look, I really believe in what you're doing. Um, we're in. We will build your Android application. And you know, I can only say that when he told me what they typically would charge, and I told him we could pay about a fraction of that, he said it, it doesn't matter. We're we're gonna we're gonna do this no matter what. And so, you know, that was how all of a sudden we had an Android app. That's a great that's a great story. And, and by the way, one of the things that you're you're one of the things that was really cool that I just remembered was I had to, I knew we were getting demand for Android. So all we did at the bottom, at this point now we did build a website, right? And so at the bottom of the webpage on the homepage, I just put uh, sign up for our upcoming Android app here, click here. So we started collecting emails of people who wanted the Android app so that when it was ready, we could immediately notify, it was about 5,000 people, hey, Android is ready. We'd love you to check it out and test it and tell us how we can improve. And so suddenly we had, you know, 5,000 people who we could um, tell the Android story to. And to kick it off on Android. And how much did Ted help at that, at that time to, to, to kick off the, the app uh, in terms of timeline? And, and when is the, the crowd, how much did Kickstarter help? And when was it in this timeline? Yeah, so let me talk about the Kickstarter campaign first. Um, so I was actually giving a talk in Kickstarter. The, some of the folks at Kickstarter approached me and said, look, why don't you run a crowdfunding campaign? Like You're all about lots of people taking a small action for a greater good. We're all about lots of people taking a small action for a greater good. And so we did. But the trick with Kickstarter for us was you know, a typical Kickstarter campaign is, okay, we're building this thing. <laughs> and if you donate to the campaign, you will get uh, one thing, or if you donate more money, you'll get two things, or maybe you'll get two things plus this extra widget that helps the thing, you know, even more. In the Literati's case, we didn't have a thing, right? We weren't selling anything. So th- one of the trickiest challenges was what were the rewards we were going to give to those who donated? And we had to get creative. So one of the things we gave was a sleepover package 
at the Monterey Bay Aquarium, the ability for you and six friends to go sleep over, you know, under the sharks and under the jellyfish. And, and that was cool. Um, we had a couple of other things that I think experiences that people really enjoyed. Uh, we did something similar with Shed Aquarium in Chicago, um, but we had to get creative there. Yes, because you ca you cannot have like a like for these campaigns you cannot like if you if you have I don't know how many backers you had but if you have a, a, a few thousand backers you you're not gonna have like a few thousand backers sleeping at the aquarium. That's exactly right. That was a that was a, a higher donation reward. But look, raising that capital was certainly helpful and enabled us to um, start to uh, you know pay for things like storage and servers. You know when you have all of these photographs that you are now storing and all of this data that is now sitting in a database, there's a cost to that. And so raising the capital from Kickstarter helped alleviate some of that. It helped us design, you know, the next version of the application. It helped us hire, um, uh, you know, pay the, the Android development team. So it really started helping. Your question about how did Ted help? I will say that in, in my, you know, professional in, in my life, I have never been more proud to be associated with an organization than I, than I have been with TED. Um, the best way to describe that community is imagine being surrounded by people who dream really, really big and support you and your dream no matter what. It's people who are, are shooting for the moon and believe that they can get there. And there's just a support network and a trust and an authenticity that um, I will forever be grateful for being uh, a part of. And, you know, the, the, the senior, a senior curator um, and the head of the TED residency now sits on my board. Um, it's just a tremendous community. When I had the opportunity to give a TED talk, suddenly many people were made aware of Literati because, uh, you know, that talk was distributed by Ted and, and that helped a, a tremendous amount. You, you really, you've really seen a, a difference in the following after the TED, the TED talk. A hundred percent. I mean, there was just, you can't even compare the two because suddenly there's so many people paying attention to Ted that when Ted decides to put your TED talk up on their website, you instantly have access um, or exposure, I should say, to, to millions of people around the world and all over the planet. So suddenly we were getting new community members uh, from Japan, from Argentina, from Mozambique. Um, and it was, you know, a way of, once again, I think our story shifted. It was, you know, now we are part of the TED community and, and that really helped. Let's keep on going on the, the growing the community part. You sent me today... The, the do's and don'ts, your recommendation for that. Uh, so the first do you you sent me was, you're not building something for the community, you are building it with them. So can you iterate a bit on that? Yeah, this was a lesson I learned from uh, a woman named Bailey Richardson, um, who used to actually run the... So she worked for Instagram, and she was the one in charge of the Instagram account for Instagram. And so if there was anybody that understood what it meant to build community, Bailey um, is, is one of the experts. And she now runs a company called People & Co. And, you know, she said this to me not too long ago because I was asking her about, you know, what is it, what does it take to build a community of global scale? And she really, she really um, helped me understand that You got to think about it in terms of you're not doing this for them. You're, you're doing this with them. You're in it together. And so that, that's a, a slight shift in your perspective, like when you're doing it with somebody as opposed to for them. And so I think that's a, a lesson that we've learned. You know, how do you um, listen aggressively? How do you, uh, I've always loved that phrase. How do you listen aggressively to what your community is is asking for, or, or what are they suggesting, or what are they complaining about it, or what do they like, and how do you together um, get to the next level? So that's a big community do uh, in my book. And how do you actually listen to them uh, like aggressively? Do you, have you implemented some kind of you know NPS score 
uh, for the app how like can people reach out to you on like q and a how 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 do you do that with your app yeah so we've tried to make uh, ourselves um, available through a number of channels so across social media we have an instagram page we have a twitter account we have a facebook page we also have a, a facebook group which is really for you know about right now about 150 literati ambassadors uh, all over the world and these are people who are picking up four, five, six hundred pieces a day. Some some people over a thousand pieces a day. These are the people who um, are are really um, intrinsically motivated to to go clean the world. Um, and so these are the people that can give us feedback about the experience that you know we wouldn't be able to get sitting behind a desk, right? These are people out in the world using our our, our application day in and day out. And so we have, we have this Facebook group, um, but we also have a chat function on our website um, and we have a support email. And so it's really about ma- finding, uh, making ourselves available to people wherever they are. And I think more importantly than the location is how fast we can respond. So, you know, we try to, um, we have a very small team, but we try to be uh, quick to respond um, to anybody that reaches out. Um, and it's important. It's, it's really important to building trust and to building a community, letting people know like, Hey, we're here to support you. If you have a, a suggestion or a, a frustration, like how can we work together to, 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 to solve that? So that's how we've tried to communicate with the community. Yeah, it's very true. If, especially if you want people to keep on being engaged with you, if they see you're responding within 24 hours, it makes a huge difference. It really does. And I think it's difficult because, you know, as the community grows, right? Right now we, we add, you know, maybe a thousand, uh, the app is probably downloaded about a thousand times a week right now. And so, you know, we, as a small team, you know, if all of a sudden there's 50 new people every day on top of the 50 people that were, yes, you know, new yesterday, suddenly that becomes really un, unmanageable. And so it's about finding the systems and putting the systems in place to help you manage that, that growth. Um, so that everybody still can be responded to and, and feel as if you know they are their their questions are getting answered, their complaints are getting solved, their voices are being heard. Um, it's a challenge, it really is, but it's something we we hold uh, near and dear to our heart and, and, and try to do a good job of. And, and there's always room for us to improve. So how uh, practically how do you do right now when you get? Are there some points where you get like overwhelmed? With, with, with the questions and, and did you decide, okay, yeah, like actually we need to, for the next financing round, for example, what we need to do is to really increase the support team. Yeah. So of course there's always moments where you get overwhelmed, especially on, you know, days like an earth day or a world cleanup day or world oceans day. So I'll give you an example of something we just did. Um, so in this Facebook group, uh, a lot of people were reporting bugs for a recent release that we had on the app. Um, and what was apparent was that people would report the same bug, but they wouldn't necessarily see that somebody else had reported it, right? So you had this duplicative thing happening. Um, and some people were asking for new features. So what we did was we created a simple Google form and we, it is pinned to the top of the Facebook group now. And so anybody can quickly come in and they enter what their issue is or what their request is. And then it feeds a spreadsheet and anybody can view that spreadsheet. So now you can come in if you're part of the community and you can see like, oh, somebody already you know, reported this feature request or somebody already talked about this bug. And it gives an ability for not only the community to connect with each other, but also for the community to, to directly discuss any issues they're having with the team so that we can quickly respond. Everything can be consolidated into this one area. And that's one example of, you know, how we've tried to put things into place quickly to handle that level of customer uh, and community support. I, I, I love this idea of a concierge. Like how do you, same way when you go into a hotel, there's a concierge desk who does everything they can to make your experience wonderful. One of our aspirations is to get to that level. How, how do we just make people feel delighted every time they're within the literati experience whether they're using the application whether they're you know chatting on social media like that's something w- that we're working towards um and yes you know as we move up in, in the rounds of financing um you know hiring people to help with customer success and, and community engagement is clearly a, a priority 
That's a fantastic hack. I think like lots of companies could learn from that and save a lot of time in, in customer support instead of like directly thinking about the, the software solution for that. <laughs> so thank you for sharing that. Um, one very, very side note, you're talking about multiple channels that you use. What are you waiting to jump on TikTok, which is a fantastic community, especially, I, I think, given your target group, which is, I think, a lot of young people? It's a great question. Um, to be honest, I wouldn't say that we're waiting. I would say that we haven't really assessed whether or not it makes sense for us right now, given how much we have going on and our resources. So could we all of a sudden create, a t in fact, my kids keep telling me that we need it. Um, so maybe I should, maybe I should listen to them because they seem to, to know exactly what we should do all the time. Um, you know, the reality is when you're a, a startup, you have to remain really focused. It is very easy to get pulled in lots of directions. And I think that, you know, if we were to all of a sudden launch on TikTok, which could be a great idea, I'm not saying it, it It isn't, but suddenly that's one more thing we have to manage and that requires time. And I think the biggest mistake we could make is to launch something on a new platform and not pay attention to it just because we don't have the bandwidth. So um, it is something we've talked about. I don't see us doing it within the next, you know, 60 to 90 days simply because at the moment it's not a priority. It is not our focus. Um, but Depending on where we are in 90 days, we'll, you know, reassess. And if it becomes something that we think we must do next, then then we will. I think a, a good analogy that I heard um, uh, from an entrepreneur I respect is that building a company is a lot like climbing a ladder. You have to do it one rung at a time. And there's no point in trying to reach the top of the ladder unless you have, you know, made it to the first, second, third rung. And, you know, I, I am a believer And this is sort of uh, probably not what many uh, tech startup founders say. Like, I don't believe in this idea of grow as fast as you can. It's just not in my mindset. I'm a bigger believer of disciplined growth. How do you grow in a way that makes sense for your company, for your investors, for your community and customers more than anybody, right? How do you do that in a disciplined way? And so like, Could we all of a sudden go to another platform? Sure. Is that the right thing for us right now? It's not. That, that's great to hear. And I think it's a, it's a, it's a fantastic virtue, virtue that a lot of CEOs must have to be able to be focused. And if I can say, you seem also very nimble because when I hear like CEOs sometimes speaking about the next channel would be next year. So here you are talking about 90 days, 60 to 90 days, which I think is very, very, very lean. So Uh, yeah, congrats for, for, for that uh, like flexibility versus end at the same time, being able to stay focused. Um, the second do's you said was transparency is critical. So for us, transparency um, means several things. We are all about cleaning the planet. So you have some, so when it comes to litter and waste, As you can imagine, there are a lot of uh, groups and people who are pointing fingers at one another. Everybody's saying it's somebody else's fault, right? So some people say, well, it's the brand's fault because they're making material that isn't sustainable and it, you know, it, it's their fault. Others are saying, no, it's, it's the person who throws the thing on the ground. It's their fault. Others are saying, no, it's the city's fault because the trash cans aren't made to support the amount of waste and they're overflowing. And so... Everybody is talking about whose fault it is. And our position is we share in this responsibility. And we need to start from an element of truth and transparency. It's about what is lying on the ground, what is on the sidewalk, in our playgrounds, lying on our beaches, in the ocean. Start from an element of transparency and truth. Because once we have that baseline of data, that transparency, it enables us to really come up with informed decisions and solutions. So when it comes to transparency, that's the first thing we think about, like the transparency of information and data. The second thing around transparency is talking with the community. So what I mean by that is when we make a mistake, we own up to it. 
We don't try to blame somebody else. We don't say like, oh, you know, this problem happened or we could have gotten it. It's not about excuses and it's not about um, uh, trying to push it off. We believe in you, you have to own this. You have to take responsibility. And I'll give you an example. We made a major technological shift at the beginning of 20, uh, at the end of 2019. And we were really building up this uh, change for months. Uh, and it was leading into World Cleanup Day, which is September 21st. So on September 21st, 2019, that was going to be a big coming out for us with a big product upgrade, um, new partnerships. And we had been working on this for months and months and months. And we messed up. We were late. The technology was buggy. We um, upset some of our partners. We upset some people in the community. And it hurt. It hurt really, really bad. And I can remember um, on the very next, and by the way, what was really interesting is that also happens to be my birthday. And so I had this really interesting birthday where all of a sudden I had a ton of people who were really disappointed in, in me. And, and I wasn't happy about that. And I remember for the next, you know, 48 hours, the team just said, okay, we need to first just take a breath and let's just slow down for a second. What is the immediate thing we can do to fix this? And so what we decided was the first thing we're going to do is talk to the community and say, look, we've messed up and we're sorry, but that's not enough. We needed to then say, here's where we've gone wrong. Here are the mistakes that we've made. And here's what we're now doing to fix them. And here's when we think they will be fixed by. And I can still remember um, an advisory board meeting where I presented to the advisory board a slide that just said, <clears throat> it takes decades to build trust and seconds to lose it. And that's where we were. Since that first cigarette photo, since that hashtag on Instagram, I had tried to tell our story and build trust with people all over the world, whether it was speaking you know, to a, an elementary school or a group of teachers at an aquarium or an, uh, you know, some random person who saw me taking a photo on the ground. And in one quick fell swoop, I had destroyed everything that I and the team had worked for. And so the next several months was about rebuilding that trust and doing whatever we could to be transparent about our process. And it is something that we continue to work on every day. And I'm of the mindset that you have to continually earn your partner's trust, your team's trust your customers, your clients, your investors. It's about always earning it and never taking it for granted. And that is for us what transparency really means as well. That's a great experience. And, 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 and thank you for sharing that. Um, I think you had a, a last one that is a last advice about growing a community, which was take the voice. If I don't, uh, if I, sorry, in the don'ts, I've put that in the don't. Sorry, I put that in the don'ts. So take the voice into consideration, but not as a gospel. Um, can you, in a few words, very, very quickly explain that? And then we just, I just have like the last bonus question that I ask every guest. No problem. So there's this fine balance of um, listening to what your customers and clients and community members want and need. And also, believing in your intuition and your gut and giving them something that they may not have even realized they need yet. So there's a great line, which is uh, one from Henry Ford, um, who built the Model T Ford car. And he said, if I had asked people what they wanted, they would have told me faster horses. And there's something really interesting about that. This notion of, you know, as the entrepreneur, as the, as the core team, You're envisioning a future that doesn't yet exist, and you're trying to build that future. Well, 
in order to do that, you have to dream and, and, and think way outside of the box to a place that nobody else is thinking. And so if you only listen to what your customer and community are saying, you're never going to do something that is, in my opinion, uh, truly remarkable and truly world changing. But at the same time, you have to listen to what everybody is saying, because if you build something that nobody else cares about, well, you're no better off. And so it's this constant balancing act of listening to what people want, but not taking that as the gospel, meaning you have to also take into consideration what do you think needs to be built. So I'll give you one uh, analogy that, or a story that, that hopefully will illustrate this really well. Years ago, I used to be a, a bartender. And there's a position in the restaurant industry and in, in the bar industry called the bar back. And the bar back is somebody who gets the bartender what they need. And so when I had first moved to San Francisco, my first job was as a bar back. And I got a job in this nightclub that was packed with people and really crazy and very crowded and chaotic. And I can remember my first night being behind the bar and people are screaming and dancing and it's just, you know, a tremendous party. And a bar back, a bartender turns to me and in this very calm voice says, you need to know what I need before I know I need it. And I think that's the role of the entrepreneur. I think the role of the entrepreneur is to know what people need before they even know they need it and then to go make that happen. And so when I talk about take, you know, everything in th that the community and the customers say, um, but not necessarily as the gospel, that's what I mean. Do you have one specific example you can name for, for your company of something you've built or, or like a feature or something you've done uh, to illustrate that? I'll tell you about something actually we just released this week. So in the application right now, there's a leaderboard. And what it shows is there are two things. One, who are the top 20 uh, literati community members of that particular day? And it also shows who are the top 20 literati countries of that particular day, meaning who has picked up the most things uh, for this period of time. And what we heard from the community early on was, um, look, that's interesting. So, about, so we released the country part just this week. And what we heard from the community early on was we would love to see like, you know, what was picked up, at, how many pieces were picked up in France versus, you know, Switzerland or, or South Africa. Um, but people were concerned because the, there are some countries, there are some literati member countries like the Netherlands that are so far ahead of everybody else. I see that now here, like there are 6,345 pieces. I don't know if it's per, per, per day or per month for the Netherlands compared to, for the first one, that's just today, compared to the United States, it was like 1,200 pieces, like, like roughly. So it's like they're five times more. That's right. So the idea was like, if we showed that the Netherlands had, you know, the Dutch community has now picked up, I, I think it's well over 2 million pieces. So if we showed like the Dutch community at 2 million, Well, any new community that would come on board would say like, God, we're never going to catch them. Like we're just so far behind. It, and so therefore it can feel overwhelming, right? That's not the feeling we want people to have. So instead of showing an all time historical uh, leaderboard, what we did was we created it as a rolling 24 hours. So that number is live and it changes every second for the last 24 hours. So what I mean by that is if all of a sudden right now, somebody in Uh, Denmark, when and uh, you had 50 people in Denmark, each picking up 50 things. And so all of a sudden you had 2,500 pieces picked up in Denmark, Denmark would be on that list immediately. So it gives everybody a chance to participate every day. Every day, there's a new chance for you as an individual to be on the leaderboard or for you as a country to be on the leaderboard. And the community thought, well, that's probably not going to be a good idea if we show the all-time history. And we said, okay, but what if we just change it a little bit so that it's not all time, but it's every 24 hours? And I think that's a good example of giving people something they want, but maybe not in the way that they necessarily expected. So as last questions, what is the best advice you've been given as an entrepreneur? So this is a tricky one. Um, 
because I think it's entrepreneur dependent. So the best advice for me might not be the best advice for someone else. I, so I, I, I want to be very careful about this, right? Like, I, I think it depends on who the individual is. Um, but I'll give you a piece of advice that has personally helped me um, a lot, which is it's okay to ask for help. You don't have to do it alone. And nobody expects you to do it alone. And I think a lot of times founders feel like they carry the weight of the world on their shoulders and that everybody is looking to them for every answer and that they should always know exactly what they're doing and, and be energetic and confident. And, and the, the truth is for me, like sometimes you just need help. In fact, all the time you need help and having a team um, is really helpful. So you don't have to do it alone. It's okay to ask for help. Thank you. Um, what's your favorite interview question to ask candidates during your recruiting process? <laughs> uh, that's a good one. I, I'm a big fan of learning from other people's failures. So, you know, I, I think it's important to learn. Uh, so one question I like to ask is, tell me about a time when something went really, really wrong. Because therein is where I think you learn a lot about people. It's easy to talk about what went right. Like we started off today's interview by you asking me about like, hey, tell me about the good news that happened today. That's easy to talk about. What's much more difficult to talk about is what happened when something went wrong. Because that's where you learn about people's character. Character is really demonstrated when you are forced to make a decision and neither choice is a good one. That says everything. So I think that's um, a question that I like to ask. It's a really good one. Maybe I should start my interview with that, but it would be a bit too cold maybe. <laughs> and the very last questions, which book would you recommend to like other you know, entrepreneurs and people growing a startup with a sustainable social goal like yours, uh, what would be one book that you would recommend them to read? Yeah, there's a book I'm reading right now that I absolutely love, and it's called The Infinite Game by Simon Sinek. Um, you may, many of your listeners may be familiar with his work. He has a TED Talk that's one of the most watched TED Talks of all time. Um, uh, Start with why. The, Yeah, exactly. Start with why. But the book, The Infinite Game, um, is is truly eye-opening. It talks about, um, you know, building something bigger than yourself and has these different elements that, that make that up. Um, and I just absolutely uh, am, am loving every single page and, and learning a tremendous amount from it. Thank you very much, Jeff. Um, like all the, your advices today were, and, and your story was very inspiring. And uh, I hope people have, have learned a lot from you. I personally have learned a lot from you today. It's your time now to tell people what, they, what you would like them to do for you. So where can they download the app? What should they do? Yeah, well, first and foremost, thank you so much for the opportunity of sharing our story. I, I really appreciate it. Um, you know, we'd love you to join us. We would love you to join the Literati community. Um, and you can find the application on iOS or Android. Um, you can reach me on Twitter. I'm just at Jeff Kirshner, at Literati. Um, and if you want to talk to me, I'm, I'm really easy to email. I'm just jeff at literati.org. And uh, would love to, to hear from you. Thank you. I will share all these links in the, in the, everywhere on the website and on the podcast as well. So thank you very much, Jeff. Have a lovely evening and a, a great weekend. Thank you so much. If you like this podcast, there are two things you can do that would mean the world to me. The first thing is to sign up for the podcast newsletter. That way you will be notified of the new episodes, but you will also get a summary of the learnings at the end of every season. Plus, for each episode, you will get the resources and the list of do's and don'ts that every guest shares with me. And finally, you will also get the opportunity to ask our future guests one question in advance. You can sign up for this newsletter on gtimpact.com. The second thing you can do to be super helpful is to recommend this podcast. 
For that, you can write a review on Apple Podcasts and share the podcast with your friends, other entrepreneurs, and people trying to build a sustainable future. That way, we can all learn together and work on a brighter future for us, our children, and our planet. Thank you very much, and see you next week for the next episode. Have a nice day.